Welcome to Native News, our look at key issues for Natives and non-Natives alike, with your help. There's a crisis in Indian country that could kill a key link to our ancestors' original ways and past lives. We're looking at Native languages on this edition of Native News and what can be done to save them if it's not already too late. We start with the efforts of one young leader from the Lakota Blackfeet communities. Daddy loves you, me Chukshila, and that's our link. That's our font, our new font. Daddy loves you, my little precious girl. That's what me Chukshila is. Mm. Oh my God! Our look right here. Tcha atea pia petiishki. That's um Happy Father's Day, but that's in our alphabet. That's cool, huh? Very cool. Can Dylan Ironshirt is on a mission, a mission central to his native past, a mission that informs his present and occupies his future as this young man pursues his education to help save his language. It makes me, it makes me very frustrated because I always tell him when I get mad, I'm like, you know what, I don't want to be the last speaker, you know? I don't want to be like someday when I'm 70, I don't want to be, you know, that one guy everyone's calling up to get their kid an Indian name, you know, how do you say this? You know, I don't want to be that guy. You know, and if there's only 1% of me now, what I'm going to be like less than 1% but when I'm 70. There ain't no one. If, if we continue to go on the same path that we're on, then I'm going to be talking to my damn self. Dylan grew up in two worlds. A proud Lakota Blackfeet who spent his childhood years in Minneapolis with his grandmother who instructed him in his ancient language and culture. My grandma, she found out um, underground outlets to the ceremony world under underground doors to the ceremony world that were happening in Minneapolis. Um, so not only did I have my grandma's own teachings being taught to me right in the middle of the city, but because we're actually still in the country of a different um, band of our people, so even like downtown, you know, uh, Minnehaha County, you know, or the, you'd see Waziata Boulevard right off of I-90 in downtown Minneapolis, that's our language. So there's place names all over. Dylan listened and chose to honor his past and the language his grandmother exposed him to, all while living in a huge Midwestern metropolis. The world that my grandma was showing me and exposing me to was still our world, you know. And it, it was, a da it's, to me, I look at it as like, it's kind of like our, our Indian way, our, our way, our society got thrown into Minneapolis, you know, that, I mean, because it was always there, it was Minneapolis just jumped on our society, but it came up, and so I seen it, it was like every day kind of thing, you know? So growing up, um, we were having ceremonies in church basements, um, in people's houses. We would leave Minneapolis and travel a couple miles, a couple hours north into the woods, and someone who knew someone had a sweat, you know, and that's where we'd, we, you know, just adaption. You know, we just were able to adapt. We're very fortunate. Um, we can take, we can take that ceremony literally anywhere, about literally anywhere. Um, and I mean, of course, there's confines to saying that, but um, we could take it into anyone's house and have the ceremony. It wasn't easy for this child of two worlds, a city kid who would often drive the 12 long hours to his reservation. Like, they used to call me the city Indian, you know, the city boy. Or, you know, oh yeah, he's from Minneapolis. You know, I go back home to the res. And, you know, he's from next state over. He's from Minneapolis, you know, whatever. And I'm like, I'm like, yeah, well, he's from the res, you know, kind of like thing, you know. And it used to make me mad because I, I was, I had the same attitudes like them. Um, but at the same time, I'm like, how are you going to make fun of me? You know, I was raised just like you were, but I listened and you didn't. Dylan is branching out as a language teacher while pursuing a graduate degree in museum studies at the Institute of American Indian Arts. He observes elections with his unique knowledge of English and Lakota, and even to bridge the gap from ancient to new. This graphic from the Lakota Language Consortium shows the threat to native languages of all kinds, not just Lakota. Before Europeans arrived, there were several hundred native languages, but watch as time progresses. By the mid-1800s, half the languages are gone. And today, less than 12 can really be called viable. Dylan Ironshirt is fighting to change this and educate youth of the importance of their earlier native languages. I know Mary Hinton out of Oneida, Wisconsin. Um, she's the last speaker out of 20,000 enrolled members in her tribe. I don't want to be that person, you know? That's, and that's so, it hits home, you know? 
Well, today most people don't care because they they would rather watch MTV. You know, they would rather instead of thinking, "Hey, I wonder how my ancestors said TV." You know, how they say computer? How do we say laptop? Well, we have words for laptop. We have words for computer. We have words for audio visual equipment. I mean, you know, we have all these words. They're all here. You know. Preserving languages isn't just a matter of immersion, schooling, or memorization. Cultural barriers have to be respected. Many tribes feel ancient languages are sacred, not to be written or shared. It is a challenge leaders like Houston Cypress, the executive producer of this program, and a Miccosukee tribal member address on a case-by-case, tribe-by-tribe basis. Like, I'm all about building bridges between communities, bringing worlds together, um, especially through the media. So I have to find a balance that's sensitive to my community, but also um, be a part of this 21st century uh, society that we find ourselves in.